But in rejecting it, what they did was they pointed out the, the, the truthful fact that an advisory opinion is not a mandate of the court. Um, there are only 11 states in the country that have that authorize Supreme Court justices to give advisory opinions. They're not judicial decisions. They don't carry a mandate. The court properly recognized that they're not binding precedent. But in fact, they usually are treated that way. Uh, they very rarely will go against them. But they went out of their way to, in footnote 15, to say that this was not binding on us. And in fact, um, they quoted a Massachusetts uh, decision that essentially said that we have an obligation when these issues, the issues that are litigated in an advisory opinion case, come up again in the future. We have an obligation to look at them fresh without uh, regard to what was happening in the other advisory opinion. So what that says to me is that, that they're open to the idea, the argument that was made in 1992, that maybe the Ethics Commission um, does not have primary authority in the area of ethics. Maybe it still it defers to, it did not repeal the Article 6, Section 2 that gives the legislature the authority to enact legislation, that it still is, um, it would be an administrative agency that would only be able to enact regulations that are in conformance with laws passed by the General Assembly. So I think that those are two areas that people should be concerned about and should look at because they are two areas that any lawyer who is representing somebody before the Ethics Commission should take a real close look at and probably will take a real close look at. Thank you. Um, next we'll hear from Mr. Friel. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the speech and debate clause because I think that's the issue that creates the tension that came before the Rhode Island Supreme Court in the briefing and argument that we all had and that remains uh, in the uh, decision and that brings us here tonight. Um, as one who kind of believes that it's uh, illustration or analogy is a good way to make a point, I want to digress briefly to use a, a, an illustration. Um, I'm on the zoning board in my little community here in Rhode Island, and I've been for about five years, and we see a lot of routine stuff about people's homes, but every now and then we get an application that's particularly charged or contentious within the community. And over the last couple of years, we had a series of applications by a, a well-known and well-regarded private preschool for small children to expand their facility. And all the issues in the application were dry stuff about parking and traffic and the lines in the parking lot and counting spaces under the zoning ordinance. But what the applicant did at a couple of hearings was bring in a whole crowd of parents, mostly mothers, and parade them all in front of us one at a time and let us know in no uncertain terms that if we were against this application, we were against children. And of course, I, I'm not. I have a bunch of them myself, and I, but I voted against the application anyway. Um, and, I, and I think there's a, it's similar to the tension that exists here because there's a tendency to think that if you're in favor of the vibrancy and the importance of the speech and debate clause in not only the Rhode Island Constitution, but the US Constitution, been around for literally hundreds of years in our own constitutional and legal history, both at the federal and the state level, that if you're in favor of those things, and if you're against the idea of impliedly repealing constitutional rights, having them go away without anybody ever quite saying so, that somehow you're against having a vibrant ethics commission, you're against um, enforcing ethical laws on legislators, and that you somehow were for Senator Irons, quote unquote, getting off or whatever he did. And, and I don't accept that. And it's not always easy to resolve two things that are in conflict or in tension, but I'm one who believes, and this was certainly the position we argued on behalf of the ACLU in the briefing of this case, that the balance in this case got struck in the right direction. The speech and debate clause in the Rhode Island Constitution and its analog in the US Constitution for hundreds of years going back with their origins in you know, 15th and 16th century England have made it clear that legislators can't be questioned or called into question for their acts in a certain legislative core of activities. And voting and deliberation and their positions on the passage of legislation is right at the heart of that. And what we argued before the court is that A, that right exists for a reason, and it may be uncomfortable sometimes how it gets applied, 
but it's there for a good reason and it was put there intentionally. And then second, you should not impinge upon or change or undermine that right in any way through an implicit repeal by trying to put two things um, in, in concert and assume that if somebody did the other thing, they must have meant that that right should be changed. If they had meant that, they could have said so, and they didn't. And so um, that's why I still believe that the uh, speech and debate clause continues to have an important role. But I don't believe that it has to be, and I'm no expert in the procedures of the Ethics Commission. Let me make that clear right now. I don't practice in front of the Ethics Commission a lot. I don't purport to know, uh, and so I defer to others uh, about that. But I, but I guess I do believe that while there may not have been the kind of blatant brown paper envelope quid pro quo that, are, are, that is easy in a case like this, that I like to believe and I hope that consistent with the protection of the speech and debate clause, there can continue to be a way to, um, to attack the, the kinds of quid pro quos or, or inappropriate relationships that legislators can have and do so effectively um, uh, without prosecuting them or, um, or calling them into question for their legislative acts, their votes, their deliberations, and the things that have historically been protected for good reasons by the speech and debate clause in the Rhode Island and the U.S. constitutions. So that was the position we took in the ACLU's uh, brief, focusing on, on both that tension and the fact that there should not be implicit um, repeals. And just one other point worth noting, you know, the question I think this raises, there's a, 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 a sort of a, an old worn slogan that lawyers use about a slippery slope. The other issue that we raised in our brief is the question that if you allow this implicit repeal, because it seems necessary to achieve an outcome, the risk is that you're then going to open the door to other implicit repeals later that are going to wear away at, um, at, the institute, at, 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 at the individual rights and liberties that are embodied in the Constitution. We had a problem with that. So that was our position. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now get some um, comments and thoughts from the chair woman of the Ethics Commission herself, Barbara Binder, and is your mic close enough to you to pick this up? Good, thank you. Um, well, obviously I'm coming from a completely different place, and I'm slightly concerned that it's going to sound like sour grapes when you hear what I have to say, since the, set, the issue is now settled. But every time I read the opinion of the Supreme Court, I am struck anew by how really poorly reasoned I think it was, and yet how predictable I think the outcome was. So if you take a look at the decision, to my shock, the court decided not to address the very, very specific language in Article 3, Section 8, which specifically says that there shall be established an ethics commission which shall adopt a code of ethics, which shall include provisions on very important words, use of position, and shall impact all elected officials. What is a legislator's use of position? Obviously, it's speaking, debating, and voting on legislation. I can't even imagine what else they officially use their position for. Certainly, it's not just for getting hard to get tickets to sporting events. Now, a canon of constitutional construction is that no word or section must be assumed to have been unnecessarily used or needlessly added. However, in the Irons decision, the, the justices completely ignored that language of use of position. And it, to me, it was an explicit repeal of the speech and debate clause, insofar as it related to the ethics violations. And the justices, the fact that the justices chose to uh, ignore it and not address it in their decision, to me, is a stunning omission. The court instead states that there are two unequivocal, specific constitutional provisions, and that they stand in diametrical opposition to one another. The court then chose to give speech and debate primacy, and the reason it's older. That's it. It's older. Court didn't even bother to engage in the kind of normal constitutional construction that's used when there are two conflicting provisions. Usually in such a situation, the court will review relevant extrinsic evidence. In this case, there was plenty of records from the 1986 Constitutional Convention. And anyone given even the most cursory review of those records would know that the delegates of the convention intended to clip the wings of the legislature insofar as related to 